Hello. Hi, this is uh, Paul Dranigan, looking to speak with Ethan. Paul, this is Ethan. How are you, my friend? I'm good, thank you, sir. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. How is life across the pond right now? It's okay. I mean, a lot of tour cancellations, but, you know, we're, <laughs> we're surviving. There you go. Um, let's get into it. Paul Brannigan, the author of Unchained and uh, former editor of Kerrang! magazine. I used to read it whenever we could get access to it over here in the States. Love the magazine. And your first interview for Kerrang! was actually one of my favorite bands, the Beastie Boys, but you say that actually didn't go very well. Oh, it was an absolute disaster. And um, they pretty much just ignored every question I asked them and uh, spoke among themselves. Um, and the only good thing is that they're sort of natural born comedians. So when I wrote up the feature, thinking it was going to be my last feature for the magazine, uh, the people at the magazine loved it. It was hilarious. And uh, it actually probably kick started my career, which I was pretty damn sure it's going to end my career. <laughs> it's amazing how situations like that you think are the worst end up becoming actually quite positive in some ways. Yes, yes. So I've got a, a lot to thank them for, even though it didn't feel like it at the time. I think you and I had a similar drive to our career choices. You've said that being a music journalist was as much fun as you could have without being in a band. And my goal was always, if I can't be in the band making the music, I'm going to be on the radio playing it for people. So I think we have kind of a similar mindset about music. Yeah, I mean, I guess for me, uh, you know, being a music journalist wasn't about, you know, the art or the writing. It was about being that kid in the schoolyard who presses a cassette tape into his best friend's hand and goes, oh my God, you got to hear this band. Um, and that's sort of always how I've approached it, which, you know, obviously radio is the same thing. You know, you're bringing new music to people all the time and, you know, introducing people to the bands that are going to change their lives. Is that one of the best parts of your job, just finding new bands that are just coming out and saying, you guys got to hear this? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, you know, I haven't got quite the sort of same sort of foraging appetite for it at the age of 51 that I had at the age of 24. <laughs> um, you know, there's, there's younger kids who've got their finger on their pulse much more than me. Um, but it's still exciting when you hear something else which, um, you know, blows you away. And, you know, recently I've been checking out, because um, sort of international acts haven't been able to tour, really, I've been checking out a lot of uh, English and Irish bands playing in tiny venues in London over here. Uh, and that's been really refreshing, actually, seeing a lot of lot more new bands that I would normally see during a, a sort of you know, the old times, the good old days. You know, I, it's weird if you think about it. Uh, the pandemic ruined a lot of options for some bands, but then with the internet, it also was like, okay, you can still check out this band. You just can't see them live, but you can still share these bands that are coming up now. Yeah, I mean, I kind of feel sorry for a lot of people in bands because, you know, I've obviously been, you know, interviewing a lot of them over the past sort of 18 months or so. And, you know, everyone's sort of having the rug pulled out from under them and the uncertainty is a, a pretty anxious sort of time for everyone even now. But yeah, I mean, obviously, thanks to streaming services, you know, you've got the world of music at your at your fingertips and you can sort of bounce about it from one thing to the next, from playlist to playlist. And yeah, it's, it's been a really good time. All that extra free time uh, has been quite handy for uh, discovering new artists. So when was your first chance to meet and interview Van Halen or anybody from the band? Well, um, I did an interview in 1998, which was on the Van Halen 3 record. And I think at that time, um, people will know, that was the album they recorded with um, Gary Sharon, their third vocalist. So it wasn't their third album. Um, but at that time, I think uh, the whole sort of team around Van Halen were aware they might need to do a bit of a, a sort of PR drive in order to get people on side. Um, obviously, you know, they had an incredible first uh, sort of act with David Lee Roth an even more successful second act with Sammy Hagar. But Act 3 was always going to be a tough sell. And so I got um, brought over from London to visit Eddie at his home uh, at 5150 in Los Angeles, which was uh, quite a thrill, I can tell you. And, um, you know, he couldn't have been nicer. He was um, so clean and sober at the time, really proud of, you know, what he was doing with the band, really proud of having written this album sober for the first time. Um, unfortunately, the 10 million people who had bought Van Halen 1 and the 10 million people who had bought 1984 largely turned their backs on the band at that time. That album was the sort of the least, uh, you know, the worst selling album in Van Halen's catalogue. And a lot of people pretty much uh, sort of deny its existence, really. Um, so, you know, a, a tricky time for the band, but a, a wonderful memory for me. 
Yeah, I remember when Van Halen 3 came out and, you know, you got to look at the career they had with Dave and Sammy. And it's like, it's almost impossible to follow that up. Van Halen 3 was not a bad record. It just wasn't the caliber of what they'd done before. Yeah, I mean, those are always going to be big shoes to fill. I mean, obviously, you know, the thought of following Dave uh, was, you know, when I spoke to Sammy Hagar for the book, actually, he said, look, you know, I was expecting that call because realistically at the time, there was only three vocalists in the world could possibly you know, sort of have the, the sort of the talent and the ego to step into those shoes. He said, there was me, there was Ronnie James Dio, and there was Ozzy. And he said, you can't actually imagine either of the other two in Van Halen. So, you know, I was just sitting by the phone waiting to be drafted in. <laughs> there are a, a few sections where you said, did you end up actually becoming friends with Ed or some of the guys in Van Halen, Sammy, and hang out with friends? Or was this mostly just always on assignment? Oh, no, it was just on assignment. You know, I think, Van Halen are one of those bands like ACDC, actually, who are, you know, they're a very tight-knit little circle. And, you know, they kept a lot of sort of, you know, their school friends basically around them. You know, they were the people who were their, you know, their crew. So, um, yeah, as some sort of, uh, you know, naive little uh, munchkin from, the, from <laughs> Ireland uh, dr dropping into the world, I was never going to be on the, uh, you know, on the, on the pals list. I was never going to be spending any more time than them. Um, Warner Brothers were allowing me to have with them. <laughs> uh, Gene Simmons has always been known for kind of talking fairly highly of himself, whether it's actually true or not. But the story of him wanting to help break Van Halen and uh, getting denied and blown off by Paul and their management was actually true, which is kind of amazing. Yeah, I mean, I think to this day, he still can't quite believe it happened. Uh, and understandably <laughs> as well. I mean, the, the story is that Gene and Paul went to see the band while they were in Los Angeles shooting a, a Halloween special for uh, Paul Lynde, I believe. And, um, you know, they were both absolutely blown away by this sort of incredible band, like a club band, um, with all the songs, obviously, that were on Van Halen's first record. And later that day, literally, you know, um, Gene got them into the studio and started working on a demo tape and then flew them to New York and sort of completed it up there in Electric Ladyland. And um, obviously, he was thinking that his manager was going to be like, floored by the talent on display just as he had been and uh, like you say the manager and Paul Stanley were like mm, yeah, I'm not hearing it you know Gene Simmons is like what? like what what you know how can you not hear this sort of day you know the potential <laughs> in this and they were like no I don't think so and you know when I spoke to Paul Stanley for the book he said